You know what's different for me, John, when I've gone to Egypt on the three occasions? Something weird happens to me. It's like I'm home, and let me explain. It's Ah, well, yeah. I, I go to all these places, John, the megalithic civilizations, Malta, all across Europe, and, and I've been to Peru in April there as well, looking at the ancient cultures there. And, you know, I go to these ancient sites, and I'm like dogmatic. I'm obsessed with the monuments and the engineering, how they were built. But... I, I, I get so relaxed when I go to Egypt. I don't see, I don't try to process it all. I, I get just, I, and I appreciate the art there as well. And I haven't got an artistic bone in my body, John. I'm Mr. Engineer, Mr. Scientist, like, you know, but. Well, you're not actually, because you don't have, it, it, your sensibility, your head may be uh, the engineer and, and the scientist, but, but obviously your, your emotional center is open. Well, you wouldn't respond to those places that way. Exactly. And that's the thing. I respond to Egypt so quickly, and it's like bizarre. It's like this hypnotic effect on me, and I just like... Well, lots lots of people do, and and I don't know if you are a believer in reincarnation or not, but enough... I am, yeah, big time. Yeah, well, that a lot of people, well, not a lot, but quite a number of people who come with me have very vivid reincarnational memories, and there are a few stories I tell them along the way in Egypt, where, where there's really, I mean, you can't prove it physically, scientifically, but you would be, you would, you would be, I mean, mistaken is the wrong word, but, but to not take them seriously means that you're just a debu- you, you know, you're, you're, you're just a debunker and, um, who, with certain preset, with certain preset ideas about these things. Anyway, because Egypt has this special quality, there's no trip that I take ever where there aren't a handful of people who say, you know, I've wanted to go to Egypt since I was six years old. And because Egypt has this peculiar, and it's not just romance, it has this draw that the other places don't have. And one of the reasons for that is that there's so much of it left. I mean, you know, there's not that much, let's say China and India, um, probably Mesoamerica goes, stretches back as far as Egypt and was probably given the, the data that we have was probably equally sophisticated. And I mean, they also had a sacred science, but there's not much that you can visit that you can immerse yourself in. So at the end of Egypt, when back to the original question, when, when you finish one of my trips, you really understand for the first time in your life, because you wouldn't have got it anywhere else, what a, what a functioning civilization is like and contrasted to what I call our church of progress. You understand the, the diametric opposition between civilization and what we, what our, what the, what our quack academics and, and church of progress, um, priesthood like to call, I mean, these people think that they're advanced. Yeah. Um, nowadays and they're not actually, they're technologically advanced, but philosoph- philosophically, emotionally and spiritually retarded and depraved. Uh, here's the thing. I don't even think they're they're spiritually adva- or they're spiritually handicapped and technologically technologically advanced in certain areas. That's right. But I think ancient Egypt was technologically advanced on an equal level. You just but only in certain areas. I mean, that's right. They they had technologies, John. That you know, even the pyramid building to build that pyramid, John. I mean, for me, as an engineer. I mean, we don't. Have- I don't think we could do that, John. If people say I don't think we could either. No. Well, this is yeah, we could. No, and that's part of the fun when you when we go there. I don't know if you've seen this, but I mean, I I spend a lot of time looking at these things, and when you have it right in front of your nose, it's no longer on the page, and suddenly you're looking. Did you get to the bent pyramid in sure? Sure. Yeah. And uh, again, I, did you did I, you notice? Well, that's that's not in the guidebook, or hardly anything, because. When I wrote the guidebook, that wasn't open to the public, so you couldn't get in there. I think that was deliberate. I think they were tuning that thing with a frequency. I think that was definitely... Well, something like that. But if you look at... See, I mean, if you probably wouldn't have noticed it yourself, and it's hard to describe on something that's a radio show, but the casing stones on the... on The casing stones on the outer, you know, out, uh, outside the bent pyramid defy explanation. They're... It's much more complicated than, 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 than the Great Pyramid even. And one of the reasons why the 60% of the casing stones still intact, because they're put in there in a way that's, that defies explanation. 
And when I'm there with architects and engineers, you know, because I'm often the people with a lot of expertise are on my trips, they look at that and they marvel. And the academics who've never built a dry stone wall with their own two hands, it's, it's as, as simply, you know, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't even occur to them that they're looking at something that is in fact technologically miraculous. And John, isn't the Great Pyramid got eight sides as well? It's got these two... Well, yeah, it's got those, it's, it's indented slightly. Each of the four sides is, is very gently... Indented. Not curved in, but it's, yeah, I, I mean, I can't show it. Very hard to describe it. There's... It is, it is actually, it is very gently eight-sided, yes. That's incredibly complex to do, John. I know. It all is. Bad enough on four sides, but I mean... That's right. Yeah, everything, the, the deeper you get into it, the more amazing and miraculous it becomes. After all, after all your years, you, God knows how long you're researching, George, do I even say 40, 40 years, 50 years? Well, since I got introduced to Schwaller, I found out about him probably in 68, so what's that? Yeah, so that's over 40 years. Yeah. A long time, John. In those 40 years, have you developed or come to any conclusions or kind Conclusions. Have you come to any conclusions about maybe these guys were so spiritually advanced? Maybe they had a different way teaching symbolically, and maybe that synchronized the hemispheres of their brain, or maybe their consciousness was evolved because of the way they did things. And they, that was their spiritual advancements helping them. Yeah, I think. Oh, I think so. I think without that, they couldn't have built. They couldn't even have conceived of those things. And when you're there, you got to come on one of my trips, actually, uh, James, because because you, when you get it from you know the horse's mouth, and we're there having a discussion right in the si- in in this in the place, they're able to think in volume somehow or another. So you know, that is this great line of, of architecture is frozen music. Well, that's not just poetically true; it's metaphorically true. It's physically true because architecture. Is based upon harmony and measure and proportion and so on, the same as music is, except that the vibrations of a temple are not audible. They are, but, but they are perceived through our, let's say, our sensitive faculties. So when we're in an Amon temple, there are certain numbers, there are certain, let's say, chords that are associated with Amon, number, you know, number relationships, and a, a different one for Horus and a different one for, Den- for, for Isis, for example. So when you're in these temples, you are actually accessing the cosmic principle. The gods are, are in fact, are cosmic principles. To so call them gods makes it all sound superstitious, as though the jackasses that built the hydrogen bomb and the bobblehead doll really know what they're doing. Um, the when you're when you're in these places, you're actually resonating within to that particular cosmic principle, and then you can extrapolate from that because you know even. Even the ones that are in pretty good shape are still pretty ruinous. Um, you know, they're, they're not as though they were when they were new, but this is why, as I said, you get two weeks of this and, <clears throat> you know, looking at everything through symbolist eyes and you really come out of it changed. I mean, a great line, Florence Nightingale, who wrote the best book, wasn't a book, with a bunch of letters back, uh, it was published as a book called uh, Florence Nightingale, Letters from Egypt, 1849-50, who well, has a line who said, writing to back home to her parents and her, and her family. And she says, one wonders how people can visit Egypt, can, can come back from visiting Egypt and live lives the way they lived them before. Great line. It's really true. It's a, it's a, it's a life changing and life affirming experience. And it continues to be for me. You know, I mean, I've done a hundred trips and people say, well, aren't, don't you get bored? And I said, no, because I'm learning stuff all the time. And, Making this available to people and watching them, you know, watching them, um, figure things out or, or, or well, well, just watching them experience this, this awesome civilization that is so, so grossly misrepresented by the people who should be the ones who are representing it, which is the, you know, which are the Egyptologists. I have my good friend in London, Daniel. He's a Cancerian as well and he's an engineer, so he's keen to go for another trip to Egypt, like what? Well, get ten people together and you get a few. I reckon I could get a few numbers anyway, but, uh, you know, I'm just looking in the book here, John. You got the L-shaped cornerstones in there as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. These are fascinating, John. And I've, I've seen similar things in Peru as well. That's right. 
for real, you see them. Yeah, it's just an acoustic effect, John. There's only uh, there's only really an, uh, an acoustic reason for doing that. Would you agree? Uh, no, I, there's, there's that. I think that's one of the reasons that uh, acoustic. I think there's another reason that it's symbolic. That it's well, it's it's symbolic, but it's actual. In other words, the temple. There's no real word for temple in Egyptian. It's called Per Neter, which means the home or the house of the god or the house of the principal. And in other words, it's organic. So a corner is not a regular corner the way we do it. Breaks. It's in other words, it's an energetic structure. The energy is running through the temple, and so it's 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 a stone articulation, as it were. It's insofar as you can as you can reproduce an ankle or a wrist in 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 stone that's 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 what it's doing it it has some a kind of an organic and integral function as well as and probably almost certainly sound engineers have pointed this out to me that that it, it has a very a very pronounced acoustic effect and of course when these temples were functioning there's also you know this it was a it was very celebratory there are, there are, there's music being played and there's dance going on all sorts of things of this nature yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, those, those corners are, are miraculous. And when you, it's next to impossible to describe them on a radio show. Sure. The effort, the effort to build, John, the effort to build in that way is, the had a yeah. very, very important intent. You know? Oh, yeah. Well, it's, you know, this is, as I said, it's one thing after another when you're there. And, and the, all of these things that we point out and marvel at and look at and, and discuss and, you know, try to figure out, you never get from, you know, no guidebook, no standard scholarly book of Egypt even mentions this. Sure. The last, we, the last time we spoke, John, we were talking about your DVD series, Magical, Imbol- Magical Egypt, the Symbolist. Right. Era. And I see echoes in the book as well, John, and the diagrams and the, and the layout, the Temple of Man in particular. Which sure. The overlaying of the body. Well, that, this precedes by a lot, um, the, the Magical Egypt series. Yeah, that's why I see echoes in there, John. You know, it's. Oh, well, yeah, sure. Well, that was the whole idea of the series, which is, in fact, if you can't go to Egypt, it's the next best thing to it. Yeah, I think it inspires people to go, John. I think when people see Magical Egypt, the Symbolist Tour, they get inspired to go, John. Oh, they do. Oh, yeah, I get people all the time. Yeah. You know, I haven't. Which they can order, actually, you might as well tell people they can order direct from me. At a, at a nice discount. If, if it's normally about, I think, $175 for the set. Right. And I sell them for 120 Awesome. That's on jawest.net. Yeah, plus, um, plus the postage, which unfortunately to Ireland or Europe is another 25 or $30, something like that. Sure. But anyway, people can't get them direct from me, as well as the books, of course. So, but the books you might as well, you can get through Amazon UK. And you can you can subscribe on your website as well, John, can't you? For Egypt, well, to, and yeah, yeah. To my, you can subscribe to um, get on my mailing list, and then you get, then you get. Uh, are you on it? No, no. Well, actually, I'm going to be on it. I just seen it today when I was on your website, John. Oh yeah, you want to get on that because I mean, I send out Egypt updates periodically, very periodically, because I'm very inefficient at that. But you get when you sign on, you get this extraordinary compendium weekly. Of articles relating to Egypt, archaeology, general science that's put together because Graham Hancock, you know, has been really successful. He's made a lot of money from his books and he hires a guy named Steve Detweiler whose whole job is to research everything that's new and important in the, in the various sciences, not just archaeology and Egyptology, but ecology, environment. It's an invaluable resource and he sends that out every week. And if you're on my mailing list, you get that automatically coming to you. Awesome. Yeah, you you should you, you click on my website, you um, James, and you'll you'll start getting it. It's really. I'm going to do that straight after the show, John. It's I can, an invaluable resource. It looks that, yeah. Yeah. John, tell me about these phases of the moon on the on the bottom of the pillars. Oh uh, well, yeah. This is fascinating, John. I'm well, thinking. it is. Um, and is this to do with the? Is this not the part that represents the lungs, the waxing and the... It, represent, it represents the lungs, and the Nile is portrayed um, um, in Egypt. When you see the figures that are uniting, it's, it's so hard to describe this because it is so visual, that the uniting upper and lower Egypt, um, 
the they're 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 uniting it on on both sides of the Nile, and the Nile is portrayed as a trachea and a set of lungs mm. symbolically. So so in other words, the Nile there is this association between I mean the lungs are what you breathe through, but the lungs are water as well. In other words, the Nile the Nile is the is the breath of Egypt, as it were. And and so water is always, you know, in all, all cultures associated with the moon. And other, there are other associations of the moon as well. So in the area that corresponds to the lungs, they've carved the phases of the moon into the bases of the columns. And this is actually, this is a, a brilliant Schwaller revelation. This is one of the most powerful pieces of evidence that Schwaller knows what he's talking about with his symbolist theory because the, the hypers, there are hypostyle halls in every temple, and but only in this one does it actually represent the lungs of the of the cosmic man, the anthropocosm, as, as uh, Schwaller calls it, and and of course the phases of the moon, you might say, are the breath of the Nile, the, or the breath of the land, and and so only in this temple are the phases of the moon carved in the bases of the column, hmm. and if the academics don't like that explanation, they should be honor bound, except they're not very honorable people. They should be honor bound to give some alternate explanation of why anybody would carve the phases of the moon into the bases of the columns. This is a very important piece of evidence. I think that's an extremely important. Not only that, John, is there not uh, an astrological some sort of a link with that as well? I thought Cancerians, the lungs, the breasts, the moon. Well, the lungs are usually associated with Gemini, astrologically. But Schwaller does go into that. I don't have it that clear in my head. He he thought. I'm not sure that he. You know, Schwaller makes mistakes too. I'm not sure that he's correct in this. But he he thinks that on the various parts that correspond to the various parts of the body, there are representations of that correspond to the signs of the zodiac, which the, the in, in in Egyptian times, which are not exactly necessarily the signs of the zodiac that we use that come to us from the Greeks who, who get it from the Babylonians, I think. I'm not sure. Anyway, that's a, an area I'm a bit fuzzy about. Yeah, no, it's just because I, 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 I have been told Cancerians were the lungs and somebody else said no Geminis. And I, so I actually have heard that Gemini thing before. But Yeah, that's, I think standard in standard traditional Western um, astrology. Astrology. I think it is Gemini that, that the lungs. I'm not sure. Again, it's, even though I wrote my first non-fiction book was called The Case for Astrology. I found it today online, John. Would you believe it? I found a copy today online. I got. Yeah, I'm going to get a copy because I want to. Know. Oh, you can get it. Yeah, it's out of it's out of print, but actually, I'm about to republish it. Um, really? Self-republish the the Case for Astrology. Yeah. In fact, I'm in the process. I'm really. I mean, I have. Shock and I have this book of Sirah to do, but really, my my I don't have that much more original research to do in Egypt. It it really goes now to people who are much more specialized than I am. Yeah. yeah I I brought to it. Well, I mean, I made it accessible, and because I'm I'm a writer by trade, I, you know, I have the gift of 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 expression, which is most scholars do not really have. Hancock's a very good journalist, but he's not the same kind of writer. And Boval does very well. Um, I don't necessarily go along with everything that Boval says, but you know, for somebody who's where English is his third language, he 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 does very well. He's learning another one as well. He's learning. But I I you know because I'm a writer first and foremost. There's a kind of you know this satire. I, anyway, it's more like reading a novel than. Uh, what do you think of Chris Dunn's work? Uh, the He's, I, I think I think he's on to something, but Chris, I know well. He's been on a couple of trips. He, I think he's changed his mind that it's electricity, but that it's an energy structure. Absolutely, I go completely with him on that. The problem is that he is assuming that because it's an energy structure, it's some there's some kind of physical technology that allows them to do this. And the problem with that is that there's no evidence for that, and we have an awful lot of evidence. For you know, for, for well, for you know, in other words, there are there are technological feats in every step that we take in Egypt. But if there were if there were a physical technology 
you would have thought something would have been found. I mean, we have the musical instruments and we have everything they used to make do carpentry and everything they used to farm with. But how did they do this technology? We don't know. And Chris, um, at least when I cut through them last, was still holding fast to the notion that, that there has to be some kind of a hard technology that allowed them to do this. And I'm not so sure. I mean, I, I, until I see evidence for the hard technology, there's no evidence. The evidence is that they did these wonderful things with a different technology, a, a soft technology, a consciousness raising technology, something or another. I'll give you an instance, a little instance. A good friend of mine who died recently, a remarkable lady, uh, who was the head of the Fortean Society in America. You know the Fortean Society? Fortean, not Freudian. F-O-R-T, Charles Fort. I've seen something online about that. Yeah, you want to look look up. Anyway, she was the head of the Fortean. Fort, Fort was a guy who died in 1932, and he had a little bit of an income so that he didn't need a day job, and he spent his whole life looking through scientific journals and newspapers, looking for stuff that science couldn't explain and rubbing their noses in it. He was an interesting guy. But anyway, my friend Phyllis, and I, I often gave talks there. They were in Baltimore, in America. And I often gave talks there. And one day, and sorting, so anything that was anomalous is, is, is material, is fodder for the Fortians. And so there'd be all kinds of UFO people and, and Bigfoot people giving lectures there and so on. And I would be there talking about Egypt. Anyway. I know an author for Fortean Times. That's who I know. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. The Fortean Times, that's right, you have the Fortean Times in England, it was a substantial publication. Anyway, Phyllis, Phyllis was, we were sitting having a dinner one night, and the subject came up of Yuri Geller and the spoon bending and stuff. And I said, you know, to me, this seemed, the evidence seemed very good that he could do this, and the debunkers were after him all of the time. And Phyllis said, oh yeah, it's certainly true, because I can do it. And I said, well, Really? And, and, and she said, yeah, I can do that. And I, I said, well, go ahead. We're sitting at a table, and she called the waiter over and, and asked him to bring a soup spoon, a very heavy, strong soup spoon. And soup spoon came. And I mean, this could not have been premeditated. I defy any debunker to debunk this one. And she just took the spoon, she closed her eyes and got sort of meditative with it and sort of stroked the spoon back and forth between her fingers for maybe a minute or so, or two minutes maybe, it wasn't long, and then she just took the spoon and effortlessly turned it into a spiral. And when I tried to de-unspiral the spoon, I mean, it took every bit of strength and I, I couldn't unbend it. Um, so that, when, when I saw that, I said, well, maybe that's how something analogous to that they did. They had a way of working with matter in a way that's, that's, that we can't do. But she could bend the spoons. So, yeah, I think there's some sort of alternative technologies that, that can be done with the human mind and don't require, a, you know, a particle accelerator. Sure. I know from my own science, I, I read science magazines sometimes, John, and I know they did an experiment with uh, scientists in white coats. They, they stood around beryllium atoms that they contained in a magnetic field and they willed, they willed the beryllium atoms to heat up and they could measure their temperature rise just by people willing them to heat up. Ah, that would interest me. I'd like, I'd like the ref to that, the reference to that. I can't remember the article and I'll try and hunt it down. Yeah, yeah but yeah, and the yogis, yogis and, and martial arts masters do things that, that, you know, that you and, you or I probably can't do. Sure. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing, John. Maybe you're right, you know. Maybe we just don't have to have the physicality to things all the time, you know. And yeah, we do know for sure, though, that these guys were spiritually advanced, like you know, and they were. Oh, they, oh, they couldn't have. They couldn't have designed. I mean, you know, the, the people who design a bobblehead doll cannot design a temple of Luxor. In order to design it, I mean, they had to know the laws and the rules. Yeah, in a way, the spirit, the science, and the art was all mixed into one, John, yeah? Exactly. Well, that's, that's what a true civilization, this is, Egypt is a true civilization in which art, art, religion, science, and philosophy form one inextricable whole. Mm -hmm. 
they're not separate things as they are now, where scientists know nothing about art, most artists know nothing about science, philosophy is a, something is, is no longer exists, and, um, and religion is, for the most part, entirely corrupted and depraved. Mm. And they're all separate from each other. In, e in Egypt, it's the opposite. You know the Book of the Dead, John, where they talk about oh, going sure. the weather, the, fe the weather, feather is truth, and the weighing of the heart, and all these oh. that you go through and stuff. And I always wonder, John, did uh, is that pre pretty much accurately true? Where did they have a way to perhaps oh. map this, John? Oh, I no, I don't know about if they're mapping it, but they're yeah. I mean, the the, the weighing of the heart becomes Judgment Day in Christianity. Christianity at its best is a kind of remedial Egypt. It's Egypt without the science. But, you know, this is, but again, with the quackademics, it's always, the Egyptians believe this, or the Egyptians believe that, ha ha, wink, wink, nod, nod. Yeah. It never occurs to them that, hey, maybe the Egyptians knew. I start, you know, again, Bible, Matthew, um, by their fruits you shall know them. So, you want to know about a civilization, you look where they put their creative energy. The people that created the Temple of Luxor and the pyramids and the Sphinx and so on are at a, at a, at a level of spirituality that the people who created the hydrogen bomb and the bobblehead doll are not. This is, this is a given. You can't prove it scientifically, but if you don't believe it, or if you don't resonate to it, you're an idiot. I mean, you're fooling yourself. Sure, they're, they can only do these things if they're spiritually advanced. And they're only spiritually advanced not because they believe it, but it's a practice, it's a discipline. Religion is actually a discipline. It's something you do. It doesn't matter what you believe. For me, John, I, I, I looked at ancient Egypt and I've developed my own spiritual belief because of an ancient culture, really. I mean, I've looked into ancient Egypt and ancient histories around the world and I developed my own sense of spirituality as a, as a result. I think this is insane that this is what you have to do in this world. It's it's insane. And I, I'm guessing you're the same, John. This is where your own spirituality are. Oh, very much so. Well, it's what... You know, I'm, I, I'm in the Gurdjieff group and have been for years and years and years. And, and Gurdjieff, very interesting guy. I mean, if I would have, I mean, that's, that's my school, as it were. Um, I usually, usually I'm, I mean, I tell people about it, but I don't, I, I certainly don't try to get converts or anything like that. But, but Gurdjieff talks about, basically about spirituality in the sense he calls it a magnetic center. And if you, if you don't, haven't developed that magnetic center, which happens sort of accidentally as you're growing up. I mean, a magnetic center is if you resonate to, let's say, a Bach Choral or a Temple of Luxor or a Cathedral of Chartres. I mean, you know, in England, you still have England, Ireland, I'm not so sure of, but if you have any Gothic cathedrals there, but in England, there are still a few. You walk into these places and, and you're hit by it. That's, that's your magnetic center. Awakening. In other words, you're that spiritual. Um, it's not gangster rap, and and so enough experiences of that sort, and you find your way. I mean, here we are talking about this stuff. If you didn't resonate with these things, I wouldn't be on your radio show, and you wouldn't have such a radio show. Exactly, John. Exactly. You know, I mean, there's there's nobody in the American Congress who has a radio show where they talk about anything that is spiritual or anything that is ancient. Or anything that is in fact meaningful. Sure. You know, and this is the thing, this is what I do, John. I look for answers in, in ancient history and, and, and Egypt gives me so much though. That's, this is the thing. I mean, all roads right. head to Egypt for me. I mean, other ones do in a little oh, way. No. And, and I think there's anomalous cultures out there and they're great to research and stuff like, but Egypt just keeps on giving. It just keeps on. Well, it, it does. And it's also a personal thing. I mean, some people, for example, the, the, the Eastern religions are nowhere near as corrupt and depraved as the Western ones. Mm. I mean, there are still practicing, you know, lots of practicing Buddhists, practicing yogis and, and so, but it's not, you know, Tibetan, the Tibetan monks are still really doing their, doing their, their practices, but it doesn't resonate to me personally. I'm, Egypt does. But they're still, they're alive, but the, those who, those who, you know, just as, if you, if you're taking music, one person will, you know, will, will, will like Beethoven more than Mozart, and somebody else will like Stravinsky better than Beethoven. But I mean, because we have our innate preferences, that's fair enough. But I think you can say, um, I think you can say without much argument that, that Egypt is the most spectacular 
manifestation of a, of a spiritually based civilization that we have. And on the trips, you really see this because it's day after day after day after day. You go around Europe to the great Gothic cathedrals, they're, you know, they're far, few and far between, and they're basically the same. In other words, they're all consecrated to the, mostly the Gothic, to the Virgin, the Virgin Mary. Um, they're, they're very powerful places, but they don't make up, you might say they don't make up a co coherent whole, and for good reason, because, I mean, they, they were put up in the middle of a lot of barbaric stuff going on. And Egypt wasn't. Egypt had a particular blessed situation in which they were almost unsusceptible of, of you know, they had a, a, a doctrine in place that was, that was satisfying to the soul. They had a physical situation where the food jumped out of the ground. I mean, people didn't have to, they had three months of the year or four months of the year where you couldn't work because it was all flooded. So you could build temples and do all of these wonderful things. And then because they were, um, almost invulnerable to its attack, they had you know, hundreds of years of, of peace without, without really being disturbed. So it, it, it had a, a unique physical, a physical situation that allowed them to perpetuate this extraordinary spiritual doctrine and to manifest it in all of this wonderful sacred art and architecture. Sure. And do you think then, John, it, it, at the, at, I suppose, call it 3000 BC, when things came into full effect until about 1500 BC, not, uh, not questioning the Sphinx, that's its own entity, I think, but around the time of, you know, the Middle Kingdom and that, when it, right. when it fell, when, around the time of Akhenaten, did it, did it all turn at the Akhenaten stage? No, no, it, 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 it was going, it was sort of like waves on the shore where, where it's going downhill gradually, 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 you know, ending up yeah. in, in Rome, which is a, a three ring bureaucracy. I mean, Rome is a terrible civilization and that in, in turn gives way to the dark ages, which were really pretty dark, not as dark as they paint them. But Egypt, Egypt certainly was at its height at its beginning, but it didn't come out of the blue either. Um, again, this is a complicated, a uh, fairly complicated um, subject, and we're, I think, uh, we're just a bit we're not running point. out of time. I'm starting to run out of breath. You're already, but we are out of time anyway, so we won't go too deep in. Anyway, but there was a recent uh, wonderful show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Of, uh, I think it was called Origins of Egyptian Art, and it was a beautifully cu curated show where they brought together things from the pre-dynastic period, going back to about 4500 B.C., and so were extremely refined, and because they were the person writing the, the, the curator or whoever writing the explanation cards was sort of talking about they're making they're having they're they're representing animals um, because those are the animals that are around them. No, it's quite clear that the animals that they're representing hippopotamuses, crocodiles, jackals, and so on that the Egyptian doctrine, the Egyptian gods, are already in place in those. In those earlier periods, and the workmanship is exquisite, hard stones and, and all of that. So, sure. lots more. <laughs> sure. So, John, leave it at that. We leave it at that because we could talk. Okay. For, but, uh, John, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Give us out your website one more time, and if you have sure, it, it's J, yeah, website is jawest.net or .com, jawest.net or jawest.com. Yeah. And if you go down there, you'll see a place where you can. Um, um, where you can sign up to get on my mailing list. Yeah. And I have to, the, the next trips, the, the devoted to the trips, um, I'll, I'll have the information, the revised information. If you go to what's on there now, it refers to the trips. The last trips were basically the same trip. That's early November. And, um, and, uh, coming up in November, 12th of November to the 26th and another one in March. So if uh, James gets 10 people together, Please God, John, please God. You get it, and you get a trip to Egypt, which will be guaranteed a, a, a life-changing experience. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, John. I really am. You know, and I have a travel fund at the moment. I, I, it's oh good. Yeah, I'm working on my own travel fund, so it's going. Oh good. Okay. What kind of an engineer are you? Uh, I'm, well, I'm actually. I, I have. A, I have a. I have several qualifications in engineering. I did a diploma in electrical engineering, and I did a degree in. Uh, mechanical and a master's in mechanical engineering. Oh. 
And I've also a degree in physics with astronomy and I've a ma- oh, really? and a master's of science research and society. Oh. But most really? of what, what the heading that I worked under was systems analyst. So. Oh, really? Ah. Yeah. And mostly heavy industrial engineering, John. Um, oh, really? Is that your day job? No, I don't really do that anymore. I've, I've took a ah. two year sabbatical to be an author, John, and, and, ah. and the radio host thing came about because of authors that I met and I said, I might as well do a podcast. So. All oh, right. It's taken a life of its own. It's doing really well. And I mean, oh, that's good. I mean, I've had like Graham Hancock on, Robert Boval, yourself, Shaw. Uh, right. I've done the rounds with everybody like so far this year. I've done oh, well, they're, they're, 60 shows, John, already this year. 60 shows. Yeah. Well, a, cu- a couple of others you should do. Um, you should do Laird Scranton. I have Laird done already and I'm, he's coming back on. He gave me his. Uh, yeah. Laird, Laird is, Laird is very good. You might want to get in, um, Norman D. Ellis. No. Who knows, you know, wonderful writer and he's done Awakening Virus and a number of other books. Um, he's writing out them. Norman D. Ellis, um, Jeremy Nadler, who's a... Jeremy Nadler, I ordered his books already. He's coming. Ah, uh, good. Yeah. Jeremy Nadler, um... I have 50, I have $150 of books coming to the house a month, John. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, jo- Jocelyn Godwin, who, who, um, uh, Jocelyn, you know, he's English. So only only the English would have a, a guy named Jocelyn. Just what was it, Jocelyn? Jocelyn, J O J O S C E L Y N. Yeah. Uh, Godwin, G O D W I N, <clears throat> who wrote many many books. He's a musicologist, but he's written the book about Atlantis called uh, Atlantis and the Cycles of Time, and he teaches in 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 uh, what is he here in America. Uh, you know, John, when I was doing a physics degree, I, University. Yeah. I was doing a physics degree. I told, one of the guys asked me what I did for a, for fun as a hobby. And I told him, I'm an Atlantis hunter. I, I search for Atlantis like, and they said it yeah. as a joke, but he never spoke to me ever again, John. <laughs> ever again. Well, a fellow well Jocelyn's book, Jocelyn's book is the complete Atlantis book. You know, if you don't know anything else about Atlantis, it's all in there and it's very balanced. He's a very brilliant guy. And he's, he's written knowledgeably about a lot of things. Google him up. You'll find, go to Amazon. He's written a number of things. He, he, he's a professor at Colgate University sounds in New York State. And he'd be a good guy to get. He's very knowledgeable. Mm. And, Just and like a speaker. Speaker, John. That's two good tips for the show. Yeah. Good. That's, that's the best way to get referred as well, John. Well, it is. Sure. You're, you're, John, you're I'm going to have a serious friend. think about that now, this November trip on, uh, you know, I know you're a busy guy as well, but I, I'm going to sign up for the website. I have that now in the list of things to do. I'll do that right now. And uh, I'll talk to you in the not-too-distant future, hopefully, yeah? Sure, well, with a, in the, with a bit of luck, see you in Egypt on November. With a bit of luck, John. Please, God, like, I'm actually going to take November and December off because I'm, I okay. just want to switch off from the show. I'm well, not- no, better, no better place to go than Egypt because it's, uh, you'll, you'll see it. You'll see it in a very different way. Yeah. yeah, two weeks in Egypt would cure me. And I never did the proper tour, John. I only ever went on my own. And I, ne- I never wanted to go on those cruise ships, John. No, they're terrible. I know. It's like, fuck that, like, you know, Jesus. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, actually, depending, if I have the trip, if I have a dedicated trip, like a group, I'll be doing a trip at the end of January. Yeah. Mohammed, the guy who does my trip for me, mm. has the best, it's a tiny, it's a little private boat. Sure. With eight cabins in it. Nice. What, what, called the Dahabea. And if I can get that, it's, it's, it, it, he gives it to me for the usual price if the boat is free. Yeah. But that's like having a private yacht and it's, it's got a sail. Yeah. You go sailing up the Nile. It's, it's sort of a, a dis, it's descended from the actual, you know, pharaonic boats. Yeah. And there are a number of those on the thing, but the big cruise boats, no. Yeah, I watched, anyway. I watched the program with Joanna Lumley and she was on one of those Nile, Nile cruises. Yeah. My God, the entertainment on board would have just turned my stomach. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> so. That depends, actually. That they're, anyhow, I, I don't do those big boats anymore because there are too many of them. I used to because people, I had, I found it very difficult to sell the trip without the Nile cruise because it has this glamour and allure to it. And it really isn't because you're only, you're only sailing a day and a half and the rest of the time you're on a floating hotel. You're better off being in a regular hotel. Sure, sure. But with the Afandina, with the, with Mohammed's boat, that's different. That's just, this is a different experience. Sure. John, I look forward to your next publication as well with yourself and Doctor Shock. And that sounds very interesting. And uh, that'll be a while, but not too long, because we're 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 gear, we're gearing up for it. Sure. And I'll, I will have the time to work on it. 
um, which I haven't had the last few years. Sounds interesting, John. Okay, you're, James. You're a busy man. I'll let you go. I am, and thank you. Uh, Very good, James. Good talking to you. You too. Look after yourself now. You too. Bye now. Take care. Bye bye. You know what's different for me, John, when I've gone to Egypt on the three occasions? Something weird happens to me. It's like I'm home, and let me explain. It's Ah, well, yeah. I, I go to all these places, John, the megalithic civilization, Malta, all across Europe, and, and I've been to Peru in April there as well, looking at the ancient cultures there. And, you know, I go to these ancient sites, and I'm like dogmatic. I'm obsessed with the monuments and the engineering, how they were built. But... I, I get so relaxed when I go to Egypt. I don't see, I don't try to process it all. I, I get just, I, and I appreciate the art there as well. And I haven't got an artistic bone in my body, John. I'm Mr. Engineer, Mr. Scientist, like, you know, but. Well, you're not actually, because you don't have, it, it, your sensibility, your head may be uh, the engineer and, and the scientist, but, but obviously your, your emotional center is open. Well, you wouldn't respond to those places that way. Exactly. And that's the thing. I respond to Egypt so quickly and it's like bizarre. It's like this hypnotic effect on me. And I just like. Well, lots, lots of people do. And, and I don't know if you are, uh, are a believer in reincarnation or not, but uh, enough. I am. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Well, that a lot of people, well, not a lot, but quite a number of people who come with me have very vivid reincarnational memories. And there are a few stories I tell them along the way. In Egypt, where, where there's really, I mean, you can't prove it physically, scientifically, but you would be, you would, you would be, I mean, mistaken is the wrong word, but, but to not take them seriously, finish one of my trips, you really understand for the first time in your life, because you wouldn't have got it anywhere else, what a, what a functioning civilization is like, and contrasted to what I call our church of progress, you understand that the diametric opposition between civilization and what we, what our, what the, what our quack academics and, and church of progress, um, priesthood like to call, I mean, these people think that they're advanced. Yeah. Um, nowadays and they're not actually, they're technologically advanced, but philosoph philosophically, emotionally and spiritually retarded and depraved. Uh, here's the thing. I don't even think they're they're spiritually are they're spiritually handicapped and technologically technologically advanced in certain areas. That's right. But I think ancient Egypt was technologically advanced on an equal level. You just but only in certain areas. I mean, that's right. They they had technologies, John. That you know, even the pyramid building to build that pyramid, John. I mean, for me, as an engineer. I mean, we don't. Know. I don't think we could do that, John. If people say I don't think we could either. No. Well, this is yeah, we could. No, and that's part of the fun when you when we go there. I don't know if you've seen this, but I mean, I I spend a lot of time looking at these things, and when you have it right in front of your nose, it's no longer on the page, and suddenly you're looking. Did you get to the bent pyramid in sure? Sure. Yeah. And uh, again, I, did you did I, you notice? Well, that's that's not in the guidebook or hardly anything because. When I wrote the guidebook, that wasn't open to the public, so you couldn't get in there. I think that was deliberate. I think they were tuning that thing with a frequency. I think that was definitely... Well, something like that. But if you look at... See, I mean, if you probably wouldn't have noticed it yourself, and it's hard to describe on something that's a radio show, but the casing stones on the... on The casing stones on the outer, you know, out, outside the bent pyramid defy explanation. They're... It's much more complicated. That means that you're just a you, you know you're 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 just a debunker, and um, who with certain preset with certain preset ideas about these things. Anyway, because Egypt has this special quality, there's no trip that I take ever where there aren't a handful of people who say, you know, I've wanted to go to Egypt since I was six years old, and e because Egypt has this peculiar. And it's not just romance, it has this draw that the other places don't have. And one of the reasons for that 
is that there's so much of it left. I mean, you know, there's not that much, let's say China and India, um, probably Mesoamerica goes, stretches back as far as Egypt and was probably, given the, the data that we have, was probably equally sophisticated. And I mean, they also had a sacred science, but there's not much that you can visit that you can immerse yourself in. So at the end of Egypt, when back to the original question, when, when you finish,